in matters of doctrine, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. But in all things, even doctrine, love and charity. But because of that matter of opinion category, it's sometimes difficult to practice that. But this is the spirit in which today's lesson is shared because this matter gets lots of opinions tagged and tacked onto it. Like a bulletin board, it can get a little cluttered at times. But there is a foundation of a specifically stated doctrine that we can't ignore if we acknowledge and respect the authority of God's word. It was in January, around that time of the beginning of the year. The elders gave me several topics to address, and at least by that list, today is the last one addressed from what was given then. And based on this content, I encourage you to follow up in the PDF format, email to all on that list, or a few extra copies, or if you can use your phone and take a screenshot and follow this web address for a 30-plus minute read, this is a great extra resource for you to follow up with. It may answer some of the questions that we don't have time to deal with today. But I thought about uh, hesitating, but in this case, no, I'll be funny on purpose. Just, just funny on purpose by way of illustration. Yeah, today is a sensitive subject, so the elders asked me to address it. Okay, all right. Oh, oh, that wasn't worded quite right. Let me, let me change that here. The elders have asked me to address a sensitive subject. Ah, see the difference. That's much better. See the importance of what you say and how you say it. Always attention like that is given to a lesson. Today is no exception. Does the Bible limit women's spiritual roles? This question is not actually difficult to answer. It's just that it's a matter very controversial. And so perhaps the application thereof becomes difficult. I think it's necessary to first make a few general observations before we address the answer and building up to it for for, for perspective's sake. Number one, the question has arisen as secular feminism has also been on the rise. And of course, that's no accident, nor should it be any surprise. Frankly, women have been greatly mistreated in our world and in our own country. I wish I could say America's track record is far better, but not that long ago they didn't have the right to vote or would receive the same pay for the same hired quality work. This kind of behavior is simply a violation of the golden rule. And although these things don't, uh, well, things don't go well in a society when God's will is ignored, it's still no surprise that if the movement that we call feminism has arisen in our midst, nor should it shock us then that the avid adherence to their philosophy, both as it began and what it has become, turns a blind eye to any observable differences and has caused it to question every stereotypical role of women in our culture. And has therefore attacked any perceived standard as such. So this next observance is not related to the last, except that it's an observation of what the Bible claims about itself. And you heard it well spoken and read earlier. 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible claims to be that divinely inspired document of God's will, our Creator's will put on pages for man. And this means it is inspired. The original given will and transcribed will is without error. And admittedly, if uh, the rest of this answer won't mean anything to the person who does not believe that. But at least you can know where we come from. If you hold to a different premise, then you elevate your own understanding and knowledge, and you will depend on your own logic and wisdom and experience, and you'll probably arrive to a different conclusion. We believe, at Oak Hill, we believe, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. And we admit the fact that the Bible does reflect cultural setting in which it was written. It does. In in its pages, you can see that. It was written in real time, and sometimes culture is reflected in its writings. 
And this means that some things within that inspired, preserved text are cultural rather than eternal, and discerning the difference requires humble prayer and very good, careful study. In fact, we do both. We humbly pray and study hard because we do believe it is inspired, authoritative word of God. If we didn't, then why would we even begin? Point three, though, all people, whether it be man or woman, share the same responsibility with God in terms of biblical equality. Biblical equality, that is, accountability, responsibility, value, and importance. You know that I love Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. As many of you, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ... That means, <laughs> that means there is neither Jew nor Greek. Huge distinction at the time, but not anymore. There is no distinction between slave or free. There's no difference then in the same category of male or female. This means there is absolutely no hierarchy distinction among any of you in terms of value. For you are all one in Christ And in Christ, there is absolute equality between races, social social economic groups, and yes, the two sexes in the eyes of God. That is the biblical view of equality that those outside of Christ, outside, not in Christ, but in the world and its ways will never know. But God has offered this incredible equal equal access of salvation to anyone. It's a beautiful gift, just ours for the taking, no matter who you are, and that is wonderful. But from this equality, there is an axiom to mention, and it is so important, I will repeat it twice. Unless unique and specifically defined roles are identified In the Bible, for either gender, then we must assume that men and women share equal responsibility before God. That is very important to know. Unless unique and specifically defined roles are identified in Scripture for either gender, then we must assume that men and women share equal responsibility before God. And I think about the parable of the judgment scene more and more these days. Matthew chapter 9 verse 25, the sheep and the goats being divided right and left. Jesus simply said to all of them, and the situation of the day is if you're in prison, you're there until your trial. And if you don't have someone to take care of you, you're, you're in trouble. So there's always opportunity of people in need to help. He says to the sheep and to the goat, he said, You saw some people hungry and thirsty and in need and imprisoned and naked. Some of you did something about it, and some of you did not. The sheep did. The goats did not. So Christianity is fundamentally about truth in love. And therefore, you have three categories of service that just keep shining through the pages of Scripture, emanating from within the text, off the pages. Benevolence, edification, and evangelism, all that's with, entailed within all of that. So based on this alone, 99% of our walk before God is not gender-related at all in terms of our responsibility as His children. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. You can care for others. You can treat everyone the way you want to be treated and the way that you know they would want to be treated. And that just leads to the fourth observation. Number four, there is a difference between recognizing this equality and ignoring God-designated roles between men and women. Appreciated Larry's prayer earlier. If, um, if to merely speak as the Bible speaks, it's neither prejudicial nor degrading to say that in certain instances, the roles between men and women are simply different. By design. I think about the qualifications of elders in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. That being mentioned, this illustration or this analogy might have a weakness or two as we go from the physical to the the spiritual, but the principle is still there by God's design. 
It's no more degrading or insulting to say that it's not a woman's role to be an elder as it is to say it's not my role to bear a child. It's just not within the scope of God's plan. I mourn that the world, and even more so when those within the church, turn this into a matter of superiority or inferiority because it's just a question or a matter of roles. So let's see how the Bible speaks of women in their roles. Getting specifically to this question, are there limitations? We have four critical examinations to look at. Number one. Biblical Christianity, contemporary to its birth and always counterculture, shows tremendous respect for women. Jesus himself always sets the example perfectly of the things that he teaches. And by the times that he encountered women and had conversations with them, he showed not just attention, not just compassion, but incredible respect. In a culture where Jewish women were not even allowed to read the Torah, Jesus in John chapter 4 violated every tradition of his day by engaging in a religious conversation with a woman who had had five husbands and was presently in an affair. And think of the conversation he had with her. In John chapter 8, Jesus literally saved the life of a woman caught in the act of adultery. And here's an idea to consider for your own reading. This lady, possibly as a victim of just a plot to trap Jesus, they didn't care about her for sure. And if they had stoned her, they would not have mourned her death. Remember his encounter with the widow at Nain. He raised her son back to life. And don't forget about the Syrophoenician Roman in Mark chapter 7. I love to talk about that one. If you read the context, you can imagine why. Uh, I'll just say this. Jesus, in his own unique way, made it clear to those who needed to know, society viewed this lady as a dog, but he didn't. And he blessed her faith and her family. In Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Jesus was followed by a number of disciples, and many of them included women. And by the way, women were not disciples in that day and time, but they were for Jesus. You know, some of the closest friends that he had were were Mary and Martha and Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala. And uh, she, wow... Even given the honor of being the first one to see the resurrected Lord, I want you to think about this. Think of how the most important event on earth, which validated the cross, of course, was first shared by the testimony of women. Go through the gospel accounts and and you'll see if there's any just cause to not say Jesus was the great women's liberator of the day. But that being said... I know that it's not really with Jesus (laughs) that um, modern theologians and we would say secular feminists necessarily have their spat with. At least in their eyes, they wouldn't think so as much for a reason we'll say later. But no, they hurl most the stones of sexist allegations toward the Apostle Paul. And that's unfortunate because those claims are baseless. One critic of Paul wrote this. A frustrated, disappointed old bachelor who never married and didn't know anything about women, nor ever wanted to live with a woman. Wow. Those allegations don't set well with those of us who have studied his writings and have accepted them for what the Scripture claims them to be. And that's the whole observation number two. That the Bible is the divine word of God. And God used Paul to write the majority by number of the New Testament epistles. But even if one did not accept this view, just the reading of the letters will show that those claims and accusations are absurd. Because, well, it's just first of all sad that his entire works, his entire life and devotion, all of his writings are discounted because of a few statements. 
that the Spirit of God guided him to write. Which culture says reflects the male-dominated, machoistic Jewish and Roman world of the day. But consider how Paul reflects in his writings the highest view of women in contrast to that a number of times. The first sermon Paul preached in Europe, we talked about this a few weeks ago, was to a group of women and accepted the invitation of lodging with one in one of the homes of one of the converts, graciously, of course. Paul wrote to the Philippians, and only two people are mentioned by name. And guess what? Both of them are women, good friends of his. When Paul preached to Thessalonica and Berea, the Bible says that several women were included in that tremendous response. When Paul preached in Athens, there wasn't as good of a response. But it is interesting to note that among the converts was a woman named Damarith. The last chapter of the book of Romans, the, uh, we would call it the greatest treatise on grace in all of Scripture. The last chapter, Paul writes his personal salutations, and women are mentioned all throughout there. A lady named Phoebe was first mentioned. But again, point three, such accusers of Paul just overlook all of this. They deny to the core plenary or complete inspiration. This is a convenient platform, by the way, to stand on if you come across anything in Scripture that you don't like or disagree with, with present understanding. Just remember that. And yet, just to read the text would make it evident that each writers of the New Testament highly esteemed women and highly praised their involvement in the church that Jesus established. Staying in Acts for a moment... Acts chapter 4, Dorcas was praised for her benevolent and serving spirit. Read the account and you'll see how much she was appreciated. Wow. Acts chapter 18, Priscilla helped her husband Aquila to teach and convert a man named Apollos who became a great evangelist. Scriptures are filled with things like these to anyone who has open eyes and hearts to see and hear. But let's get to the point of the matter. It did fall as Paul's lot. To teach, not only to baptize and commend and praise and work with women, but to discuss some of the God-given limitations on their roles. Answer implied. Point four. Let's just read 1 Corinthians 14 now. Beginning at verse 34 for our purposes today. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. But they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to inquire something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. There it is. That's, that's the line. Uh, in the broader context of the Corinthian congregation, they're having a lot of troubles, and we can only guess what the questions the members are asking Paul by how he responds A lot of study leads to this little keynote from chapters 11 through 14. And the summary verse there in verse 39 and 40. Paul seems to be addressing confusion over spiritual gifts in the worship assembly. How all that plays in. And after some study, Paul is essentially saying this simple idea, hey, worship should not be chaotic. Regardless of how enthusiastic, emotional, or spirit-filled a service might be, it must reflect the nature of God. And there in verse 33, it's reflected in this orderly fashion. For God is not the author of confusion or chaos, but of peace, that is to say order in this case, as in all the churches of the saints. Someone says, how do you know this is the context of the assembly of worship? Well, look at the verses and it gives you some clues. Verse 23, if the whole church 
comes together. Verse 26, when you come together. Verse 28, if there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep silent in the churches because the speaking in tongues or languages was to be understood. Take that note. Verse 34, women should keep silent in the churches. Verse 35, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So within this context of worship, Paul mentions this issue that they apparently had. The issue was women were interrupting some of the times they actually had orderly worship. Now, admittedly, that would be a dishonor for anyone, right? But is there a deeper reason this was specified? Hold that thought. And even as I say that, I'm reminded of the instruction of Paul's word here for women to... So revere God and respect the orderly worship so as to not risk disturbing the proceeding, even with an important question, until it's over. Until the worship of God was over. Quick key point. Paul does not say in this text that every utterance of her mouth so disturbs the assembly, because we can't negate singing, for example. But this passage does not prohibit her from speaking nor even teaching in a setting other than the worship assembly. And a classic example of something more modern than you might realize is a Bible class. And there's a key point too. This silence is not universal. Colossians 3.16, every Christian is to sing. Matthew 10.32, every Christian ought to be willing to confess the name of Christ. Evangelize. Matthew, uh, let's see, James chapter 5, verse 16, every Christian ought to be willing to confess personal sins. And applications vary, of course, but Paul is making sure that women neither interrupt nor take the lead by application in the assembly. And now I refer you to 1 Timothy 2. Because up till now, just staying in Corinth uh, matters. You may think, well, wasn't Paul just reflecting the cultural norm of the day with some of those other verses you didn't mention? (laughs) And not in some eternal purpose to bind on everyone? Uh, Doesn't it just reflect the first century and not the 21st century? 1 Corinthians 11 does mention some cultural practices that we don't do today. And surely this falls in that category, right? 1 Timothy 2 doesn't just deal with the assembly, but with the male and female relationships in general. Above the culture of the day, it takes out this question from the first century context, and it supports this matter of female submission, quietness, and honorable subordination all the way back to the beginning of time, creation itself. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. 1 Timothy 2, 13, 14. Because Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not the first transgressor. Eve was. It's another lesson to have about the seriousness of the husband's role, how Adam was also held accountable for that. That's a whole other subject. But those are the two reasons that a woman is to learn in subjection from her husband regarding families and spiritual assemblies. Culture of the day certainly mistreated women, but Paul's argument here to Titus says it has nothing to do with that, nothing to do with the day and time, but it goes back to the beginning of time. And please do not misconstrue the application of verse 11 and 12. If you were to just read verse 12 alone, You would be able to say, well, it's in the Bible. A woman's forbidden to teach. Well, it's in the Bible. That's how it is. Well, some other verses before and after that very same statement are in there too. That part alone does say, I do not permit a woman to teach. But that idea on its own would put Scripture in conflict with itself. And we know that can't be right. So let's look at Titus 2, 3 through 5 as this command as a whole. Uh, well, Titus 2, 3 through 5 actually commands women to teach and the younger women. Acts 18 favorably noted, uh, let's see, Priscilla's work with Aquila in a way that taught Apollos that did not usurp the authority. And we'll mention that. So let's look at this whole context of 1 Timothy 2, verse 12 as one principled command with details to note. Verse 11. 
Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. There it is. Culture will condemn Scripture, but Christians will give due honor to those who are choosing to live by Scripture. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, of course, a woman can teach, but not in a setting where it displays authority over a man for those reasons stated in the following two verses. Divine, honorable design and shameful disobedience. So, in conclusion, a woman may, well, is to be silent, to not disturb the public worship. That's 1 Corinthians 14. A woman may teach. Yes, 1 Corinthians 11, Titus 2, Acts 18. A woman may teach other women and children. Yes, Titus chapter 2. A woman may teach a man in a setting where she doesn't have or reflect ungodly or um, undue dominion over or authority over him, 1 Timothy 2 and Acts 18, again, as a reference. This is the foundation that God gives us to stand on. And in this matter of a woman not exercising authority over a man, every eldership and every member must prayerfully discern all of their decisions and all of their dealings. And yes, sometimes our conclusions are a are, are, are reflection of the degree of study and maturity that we have. Convictions, therefore, will often differ as to how that applies, as to what a lady can and can't do. And as hard as it is for some people to grasp this concept, oh, please grasp it well. In some instances, both could still be right and pleasing to God, firmly convinced in their own mind as they live out their convictions to honor God. I simply emphasize Acts 18 again and how sometimes, somehow, Priscilla taught Aquila in a way that did not have dominion or authority over him. Please just be careful to not fall into the trap, and it is a trap, of being too lenient or at the same time being too stringent. And of course, never unduly judgmental to those who disagree in terms of decision, discernment, and application. I could list several more ideas, and I hesitate, so I'll just say this. I know what some have been told. I know how some have been taught, and even why. <laughs> I think it would surprise some people how lenient I am on some things and how personally strict I would be on others if I could bind my uh, prudent preference on others. But for the sake of unity, I will never cause undue division just for an opinion or preference. I would not push any lady to compromise her conscience. But I will encourage you to note that Scripture would not place any blame if a lady respectfully commented or asked a question in a Bible class. Uh, even in an orderly worship, I would not condone any well-timed amen from anyone. But again... It's areas like these that people develop their personal convictions. We just know what the Scriptures say. And God wants a woman to be fruitful in, his, in her service to Him. But yes, there are limitations in her spiritual roles. And we hold to the Bible for what it says because it is the Bible. God's inspired Word. So in closing, if the limitations and specific gender roles are according to Scripture, we must remember, we absolutely must remember, it is His will that we are desiring to follow. And it supersedes any philosophy of the world. It's God's will. And that determines all the decisions that we make. God likes the life that is lived in submission to His will. His will. And as it comes to putting on Christ in baptism, it's this idea of faith that yields itself to obedient response. That when I do what the Bible says, for the reasons the Bible says, in the way the Bible says, I will have the blessings that the Bible promises. Forgiveness of my sins. 
His presence and power with me as I live and walk in the light, continually cleansed, waiting his return to forever be with him. That's God's will. Do you need to put on Christ in baptism and honor him in accordance to Scripture? If that be the case, don't keep him waiting. Let us help you as we stand and as we sing.